and finally dived for the luncheon basket. When all was ready, the mole, limp and dejected, took off his seat, took took his seat in the stern of the boat. Ratty, he said as they set off, in a voice broken with emotion. I'm I'm very sorry. I've been a complete ass, and I know it. <laughs> to think that I might have lost that beautiful luncheon basket. Oh, will you uh, over overlook it just this once and let things go on as before? <laughs> That's all right, said the rat cheerily. What a little wet wa water rat. I'm more in the water than, than out of it most days anyhow. Don't you th think any more about it. Look here. I think you'd better come and stop with me for a time. I'll teach you to row and swim, and you'll be, and you'll soon be as handy on the water as any of us. The mole was so touched by his kind manner, he could find no voice to answer him. He'd already, and he had had to brush away a tear or two with the back of his paw. But the but the rat kindly looked in the other direction, and soon. The mole's spirit revived, and it was even able to give some back talk to a couple of more hens who were sniggering at one to one another about his bedraggled appearance. When they got home, the rat had made a bright fire in the parlour and planted the mole in an armchair in front of it. In dressing gown and slippers, he, t he told him river stories until supper time thrilling stories they were too, and to an earth-dwelling animal like Mole, stories about weirs and sudden floods, leaping pike and herons, adventures down drains and night fishing with otter, excursions far afield with badger. Until eventually it was time for supper. Supper was a most cheerful meal. But shortly afterwards, a terribly sleepy mole Mole had to be escorted upstairs to the best bedroom, where he laid his head on his pillow in great peace and contentment, knowing his newfound friend, the river, was lapping the sill of his window.